I'm Julia Cosby. In today's news talk, I'm joined with Canada's former ambassador to Afghanistan, who's also Canada's former minister of citizenship and immigration, Mr. Chris Alexander, on his paper titled Ending Pakistan's Proxy War in Afghanistan. This paper has been published by a prominent Canadian think tank, McDonald Laurier Institute. Welcome, Mr. Chris Alexander. Uh, you've written in your paper, Ending Pakistan's Proxy War in Afghanistan, in context of ongoing U.S. peace talk with Taliban, uh, quote, a sneaky peace process is staggering under the right, um, the weight of daily explosions, brutal assassinations, and uh, rising violence, nationwide support for the empowerment of women and girls as journalists and legislators, entrepreneurs and police officers are now under threat." Unquote. My question is, uh, does the world really care about these concerns when it comes to dealing with uh, the Afghan peace process? Well, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Does the world care much about what's going on outside of their immediate uh, vicinity. I mean, we're all locked down in bubbles, turned inward because of this COVID pandemic. And over the longer stretch, there's been isolationism, uh, a mentality of isolationism and a turning away from involvement in the world for many years now. Um, that said, I do think that Canadians and others around the world uh, were proud to have supported the empowerment of women and girls in Afghanistan, for example, to have supported the emergence of a democracy, of freedom of speech in that country. And they don't want to see it reversed, uh, abandoned, washed away. They don't want to see the Taliban come back. Uh, and so the message in my paper is that um, achieving peace in, in Afghanistan is still possible. It doesn't have to involve Canadian soldiers or U.S. soldiers who are now going home. We hear from President Biden today. Uh, we, as a military force, are actually no longer relevant. What's important now is our attitude towards the country that has been the supporter, the sponsor of the Taliban and of the violence over these last 20 years and even longer. And that is uh, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. That is Pakistan's military that has been doing this covertly. It was debated whether they were doing it for too long. Uh, but when Osama bin Laden was found living in relative comfort outside of uh, Pakistan's premier military academy, their equivalent of RMC or West Point, it became pretty, pretty clear what they've been doing. Uh, and over the last 10 years, a consensus has emerged that they are the essential backers of the Taliban. Without them, the Taliban would collapse. And so our efforts need to focus politically on ending Pakistan's proxy war, and that should involve sanctions, in my view. Okay, uh, there's been some very interesting news uh, that was released today about uh, Biden announcing that the troops will leave Afghanistan by September 11th. Uh, he said that it's time to end America's longest war. Uh, what's your uh, viewpoint on that? Because it seems like you're uh, you're more for having uh, having all these organizations in Afghanistan to protect it. Yeah, well. First, I'm not surprised to see this announcement come from Joe Biden as president. Uh, I first met him, well, the only time I've met him in person was uh, in Afghanistan in early 2009 when he was the vice president-elect uh, for president-elect Obama. And he wanted to see U.S. troops go home even then, you know, two years before Osama bin Laden was killed, uh, 12 years uh, ago. So, so his view hasn't changed. Uh, what has changed is that there is now a negotiation underway with the Taliban. U.S. troop levels are much lower than they were under Obama, 2,500 soldiers who are not fighting every day and who haven't had lost a single member to Taliban attacks for quite a long time. So the U.S. is militarily much less relevant to uh, peace, to, to the fortunes of Afghanistan. What is really uh, in question now is whether the main aggressor, Pakistan's military operating through proxies, will be allowed to continue uh, hammering Afghanistan with the conflict that they have fueled for decades. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, which was invaded 
partially by Russia in 2014, and which is threatened again today. We sanctioned Vladimir Putin and his uh, institutions and their leadership very severely. That should be the same treatment that anyone, any senior leader in Pakistan supporting this, this uh, conflict receives. It's a question of consistency. It's a question of uh, finishing the job. It's a question of doing what's necessary to bring about a real ceasefire. And after 20 years of involvement and support for Afghanistan, we've earned the right to stand with Afghans in addressing this last major obstacle to peace. What do you think about the significance um, of what he's saying? It's exactly 20 years after uh, he said everything's going to be gone by September 11th, uh, 2021, which is very interesting because of September 11th, 2001, exactly uh, 20 years later. Uh, what do you think of the significance of doing it basically right on the anniversary? That's the cutoff date. Well, we can all understand U.S. impatience. Um, we can all understand the importance, the symbolism of these anniversaries, and that the U.S. military has been in combat or supporting combat operations in Afghanistan for even longer than it was in combat in Vietnam. At the same time, U.S. forces have been in Korea, in Japan, in Germany, and other parts of the world, uh, upholding a larger peace for even longer. Uh, and so, the question is whether Afghanistan is going to be part of that larger peace that we would all like to see uh, spread across the whole world eventually. Uh, to achieve that, we have to not fight in Afghanistan, not continue what we've been doing, but take a political stand to stop the belligerence of neighboring Pakistan, which has been fueling this war. And that's what my paper is about. Mm -hmm. I think that's what intelligence reports and deeper analysis of the conflict have been about for many years now. Uh, and this is not an easy issue to address. It's not, this Pakistan's proxy war is not just 20 years old. They were added in the 80s against the Soviets with U.S. support. And there's a deeper history here of British, under the British Raj, of colonial yes. uh, interference in Afghanistan. We're talking about ending that entire legacy. It's unacceptable in 2021. Uh, proxy wars uh, have led to stern responses in Ukraine, in other parts of the Middle East. We have to be consistent now in, in, in facing down uh, this kind of destabilizing behavior from Pakistan's generals. I know one thing that you're mentioning in your article, I know you're talking about proxy wars and how it's affecting uh, different parts of the world and uh, different things that we'll see. Um, one thing that stood out to me uh, when I was reading uh, your paper is what's going on in the UK with uh, some of the negotiations with Pakistan, uh, negotiations for maybe some information on domestic issues. Uh, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, well, I think the Pakistani intelligence service, which is the main arm of the state supporting the Taliban and other groups as they fight in Afghanistan, has been very adept in ensuring that international pressure on them doesn't grow. And they've done this by making themselves useful in preventing terrorist attacks in the UK, the US, uh, other parts of Europe and elsewhere. Uh, and there are some people in the domestic security services of all of our countries who think that receiving that information is absolutely vital and we shouldn't disrupt our relations with Pakistan in any way. Um, one reading of that dynamic is that it's a soft form of blackmail. Uh, and I don't think any uh, bilateral transaction we have with any state uh, for counterterrorism purposes should excuse that state from larger uh, uh, forms of accountability if they're, if they're supporting proxy wars, as Pakistan is doing, that killed Canadian soldiers, American soldiers, and many others. Um, so yes, for the UK, it's been a very difficult situation. The, uh, the team of operatives that um, brought about the July 7th, 2005 attacks in the UK, had been uh, in Pakistan, had been partly trained there. 
And that led to a, a, a long era of deep cooperation uh, and, and dependence, interdependence of the UK on Pakistan to prevent further domestic attacks. I don't expect to see the UK to be the first country uh, signing up to uh, sanctions against Pakistan for its proxy war in Afghanistan. But there are many other countries in Europe that are asking these questions, that um, think a different political approach will be necessary, and that want, who want to protect uh, the, the, the legacy that we have all left in Afghanistan, which means empowerment of women and girls, the right to vote, relatively free media, uh, above all, the right for Afghans to determine their own future through, through elections and, and all the institutions that go with uh, democratic structures. As the former Minister of Immigration, I think you can talk on this quite well. Uh, do you think that we could see that happening in Canada, uh, some of the issues that's happening in the UK right now? Uh, we have so much immigration coming here. Uh, do you think that we could, could see some of that coming up or even in this day and age? Well, we, I celebrate uh, our global immigration programs. Uh, I'm proud both of the fact that we have maintained high levels of economic immigration in spite of a pandemic, in spite of populist pressures elsewhere in the world to, um, to shut the door. Uh, I'm also proud that we're one of the few countries in the world that accepts relatively large numbers of refugees uh, in recent years from Syria, but from all parts of the world, because persecution in most parts of the world is at unprecedented levels right now. That said, we do need to protect ourselves from uh, the activities, the, the ambition of many states, China, Russia, uh, Iran, and others, that would dearly love to use, uh, you know, to, to, to coerce uh, people inside Canada uh, to work against our democracy, to work against our government. We've all seen through the Trump era, through um, the polarization that's taken place in Europe and elsewhere, the importance of defending democracy. And that means not just ending proxy wars, but defending ourselves from interference in our democracy to uh, through corruption, through coercion, uh, through sponsorship of attacks. Sometimes all of these threats are real. And in an open and diverse society like Canada, we have to take them seriously. How do we take those issues seriously? What can we do to prevent something like that? I feel like it's a very complex issue, but um, you've you've seen a lot of that already happen uh, as you've written in your report. So do you have any ideas about that? Well, if we see diplomatic personnel, uh, officials from other countries engaging in this sort of behavior, espionage, coercion, um, subversion, they should be thrown out of the country. It's, it's as simple as that. If we see non-state actors doing it, they should face uh, investigation and and criminal prosecution if they are um, threatening Canadians uh, or um, forcing Canadians to do uh, to, to, to do uh, to engage in illegal transactions for example uh, all of all the tools are there in our legislation uh, to act diplomatically and through the criminal justice system to prevent these things we need the political will to do this. And that means we need uh, political leaders that are willing to assign investigators to these tasks, make these issues a priority, so that we're not, um, we're not uh, uh, taken unawares and, and we're not seen to be a weak uh, link in the chain of democracies that are trying to defend themselves better today than, than we have, uh, let's say, in recent years when democracy has been under attack and, and, and faced some serious setbacks around the world. I feel like that's really hard to do because, as you wrote um, about the Daily Show, for example, um, that um, I was it the president of Pakistan uh, who was on the Daily Show. Uh, something was going on in Afghanistan at the exact same time where he's kind of poking fun, like, I don't know where yeah. uh, Osama, well, Osama bin Laden is. But this this goes back to the whole question of of isolationism and entertainment versus news. Uh, we need to defend ourselves and to succeed as countries. We need our public to be informed. Um, 
And when we turn the news into one long, uh, never-ending laugh track, um, we, we sometimes go off track. And, and that um, vignette is, is, is a good one from 2006 when President Musharraf, the general who had taken power in Afghanistan, in, in Pakistan, in another coup, uh, was visiting the United States, was wined and dined at the White House and taken to the Council on Foreign Relations and, and so forth. But he's on The Daily Show uh, where he was asked, you know, where's Bin Laden? And he laughed and basically said, well, if, you, if, uh, if I knew I'd be a rich man. You know, five years later, Bin Laden was discovered living in comfort in this compound outside of Pakistan's West Point. Uh, in 2006, I am 100% certain Musharraf and his um, then intelligence chief, um, Ashfaq Parvaz Kayani, knew exactly where Musharraf was, uh, but they were playing the whole U.S. public for fools. And when Joe Biden says today that uh, we've tried everything in Afghanistan, nothing has worked, he, he's not being intellectually honest. They haven't tried everything. They haven't sanctioned the players that were protecting bin Laden for 10 years uh, and who have been supporting this proxy war in Afghanistan that's killed thousands of U.S. troops for 20 years. That needs to be the next step. It doesn't involve military deployments. It involves being consistent uh, to, to end a conflict that's gone on for too long and to protect a legacy that the U.S. and, and Canada and all allies have invested in hugely. Uh, talking about plan and next steps, I know that you have a strategic plan uh, for recommendations following actions are required to bring peace to Afghanistan. Uh, can you just dip into those and explain some of them? Sure. Well, there are really three that are out of, out of a list of 10 that are the most important. First, the leaders of those organizations, uh, Pakistan's army, their intelligence service, the directorates responsible for Afghanistan who are supporting the Taliban, the Haqqani group, and the other military assets of Pakistan in Afghanistan, they need to go onto sanctions lists. Uh, and the sanctions should be robust. They should involve travel bans, asset freezes, uh, and more. Uh, and we've seen how effective these kinds of sanctions can be in the case of Russia, Iran and other countries, Pakistan richly deserves to be on that list. Secondly, Pakistan should be on the Financial Action Task Force uh, blacklist because they are funding uh, organizations that qualify as terrorist groups. They are state sponsors of terrorism. They've been on the gray list up until now, uh, but there needs to be, this next step needs to be taken. Uh, and then finally, the United States, the United Nations, Canada, and all the countries that have been involved in Afghanistan for so long need to support a real peace process, which should be a discussion between Kabul and Islamabad about ending Pakistan's interference in Afghanistan in return for a historic bilateral settlement between the two countries. Uh, sitting with Taliban proxies in Doha makes for good television footage uh, yes. that sometimes makes the nightly news. It doesn't bring peace. And the real peace will have to involve uh, direct negotiations between Kabul and Islamabad, supported by the entire world. Uh, those three things would take us a long way. Well, I know that Pakistan's currently on the gray list, but they never seem to make it to the blacklist. Uh, can you explain what's going on with this cat and mouse game? Well, I think they've been uh, good at dodging the bullet, serving up uh, a few changes, a few improvements to their legislation, to their reg regulations. Uh, but basically, the international community, as represented in the FATF and, and, and the other organizations to which Pakistan belongs, have been, have been we've been kidding ourselves. Um, hoping against hope that one day Pakistan would wake up 
and abandon its support for the Taliban. It has not worked. And in fact, by being so uh, lax, by being so lenient, we have encouraged this bad behavior to continue and even worsen. <clears throat> it's time to be objective about these things. Uh, uh, Stop being hypocritical. Stop having double standards. Okay, uh, you mentioned, uh, this is a quote from uh, your executive summary, uh, no international organization or state has yet made it a matter of policy to acknowledge or condemn uh, publicly the facts concerning Pakistan's covert proxy war. Uh, why is that? Well, I think uh, most countries have been frightened of doing it. They haven't had the right information. They haven't had um, unambiguous, an unambiguous picture of what's been going on. It's hard for journalists to generate that picture because if you go to Pakistan and try to report this reality, um, you will be, as, as many brave journalists have shown, uh, attacked or discredited or threatened or even killed. Uh, Similarly, intelligence services who do operate in Pakistan and try to uh, uh, find out what's going on have tended to focus more on issues that are of bilateral interest to their country rather than on what Pakistan is doing in Afghanistan. And then finally, uh, the United States hasn't taken the first step. It's very hard for Germany or Denmark or Italy or Canada to take a tough line on Pakistan if the United States uh, is is acting as if nothing has changed. Uh, and I know there are many, many policymakers, senior informed people in this administration and outside of it who know what is really going on, who are impatient to see uh, policy change. We have to make sure that their view prevails. I know I have some quotes from you uh, under Reviving Afghanistan Together uh, section. Um, uh, here is a quote from you. Uh, here was an opportunity at the dawn of the 21st century to remake a country flattened by a quarter century of war. Um, you're talking about 9-11. Uh, was, uh, uh, was now to be a deserving beneficiary of uh, of international action, uh, the international community had an opportunity to work with Afghanistan people to repair the damage. What steps of action can be taken um, over there or worldwide? I know you're mentioning a few with sanctions. Uh, what else do you think can be done or are sanctions in this day and age the best way to go around everything? Well, I think the main, the main uh, objective that will unlock the path towards all kind all progress in all kinds of other forms is a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. The moment the Taliban engage, agree to a verifiable, enduring ceasefire, then a lot of uh, things become possible for both Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, these countries have the potential to be each other's major economic partners, but not if one is prosecuting a war against the other. So a ceasefire should be the top uh, priority. It has been on the table in peace talks, uh, but the Taliban have never come close to, um, to agreeing to one. And, and that's because they don't take the decisions. The decisions are taken by colonels, brigadiers, generals, their masters who sit comfortably back in Quetta, Miram Shah, uh, Rawalpindi, Islamabad. Uh, and that's why the inter focus of international attention should be on those decision makers uh, in Pakistan and our action should be focused on them through sanctions and whatever political means are available. It almost sounds like you should just throw all the leaders in a boxing match and let them <laughs> let them deal with everything and let the innocent people just live their lives, you know. Um, one thing I found interesting, uh, you actually mentioned the hit show Homeland in, uh, in your report. I'm assuming that you're a fan. Huge fan. And, and the last season was season uncanny eight. in its ability to track events almost almost week for week. 
Um, I, I know that um, there, <laughs> um, in season four was particularly interesting, I guess probably for you as well, where they were taking, it was taking place in Afghanistan and um, it had a lot to do with uh, Pakistan. Um, as someone who uh, has been involved in, in a very like high level government over in Afghanistan, um, can you tell me how much is facts, how much is fiction? Well, it's all it's all fiction, obviously. Um, the scripts, the characters, the storylines, but it reflects a factual reality that is, in some ways, uh, even darker and 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 more interesting because this duplicity uh, that is portrayed very accurately in Homeland uh, of the Pakistani state, saying one thing publicly and doing very different things. Uh, covertly and on the ground, is the reality that Afghans are dealing with every day. Uh, and so I think this is one of the other difficulties we've had in coming to, to, to embrace the right policy towards Pakistan. Americans, Europeans, in our truth-based, rule-based societies are not used to dealing with this level of disingenuous uh, lying uh, by state officials, often done in the most charming, disarming way. Um, but when someone tells you that they are truly committed to peace and want to see a ceasefire, and then later the same day or the next day they meet with uh, the, the, the groups and, and provide support for the groups that are actively aging uh, waging war, uh, it's not just a question of a lack of consistency. The, the, this is this is diabolical levels of dishonesty, and it needs to be called to account. We need to see it for what it is, uh, and sanction those who are responsible for it. Most Pakistanis, in my experience, are deeply ashamed that their government decades, so many decades later, is still engaged in this self-defeating, zero-sum battle for control of Afghanistan. They know it will never happen. Uh, the Taliban won't come back to power in Kabul. And they also know that it has cost Pakistanis a great deal. They want it to end just as much as you and I do. What do you think are the chances that Pakistan's going to end the proxy war? Well, without international action to compel a better, better behavior, I think there's a very low chance. But with the issue of troops staying or going almost out of the way, I think um, prospects for focusing on the real roots of the conflict, which are not in Afghanistan, are actually improved. So I think today's announcement actually doesn't matter that much strategically. What matters is that we can now start to focus as a whole international community on ending a proxy war that in one form or another has been going on for two centuries. Uh, starting on this more serious task uh, will, will do us all a lot of good because uh, it, it will end the illusion that fighting in Afghanistan was ever going to end the conflict. It, it wasn't so long as uh, Pakistan continued fueling the war. We need to focus on take fuel out of the equation. Uh, and that will probably involve sanctions, but it's going to have to involve a lot of diplomacy, a lot of dialogue uh, over the months and, and years to come. And if it can be achieved, a settlement between Afghanistan and Pakistan will be a huge benefit to the region and to the whole world. These are, this is one of the very few conflicts around the world that is truly strategic in nature, that has gone on in one way or another for a very long time, ending it would do us all a world of good. Now you're asking world democracies to enact wide ranging uh, sanctions against, against Pakistan officials supporting the Taliban uh, and a bunch of these other terrorist groups operating in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, do you think the world democracies show willingness to do so uh, when you call upon them uh, in this paper? There's been a lot of interest in this paper, including from officials uh, and diplomats who know the region well. I, I haven't had any 
commentator, either a colleague of mine or even a representative of the Pakistani state, question the facts and analysis that are put forward in the paper. So I think it's a real basis for discussion. Uh, that said, uh, I think the world is focused on a lot of issues other than Afghanistan and Pakistan right now. It hasn't been on the front pages. Uh, we've been totally wrapped up in the pandemic. Uh, quite a few people worried about China, quite a few people worried about Russia and Ukraine. We need to bring this issue uh, back to the level of prominence it deserves. Uh, and I think, I think you'll see discussion about uh, these issues build, especially as a ceasefire continues to go um, you know, continues not to be achieved. Uh, and people start to ask what really is driving the violence uh, and who really is in charge, because it's not the Taliban leaders that sit around a table in Doha. Well, speaking about ceasefires, um, you recommended two more things. One, suspend further talks with Taliban pending an unconditional ceasefire. And second, suspend further U.S. or NATO force reductions uh, in the region pending an unconditional ceasefire. What are the chances of that happening? Uh, well, you have to ask policymakers in all the capitals um, that that would need to get together, Washington, Brussels, Berlin, and elsewhere. It's certainly not going to happen anytime soon. Um, but uh, I, I, I see a NATO community, um, a, a, a community of democracies around the world that really don't want to see a repeat in Afghanistan of what happened in Iraq and Syria after 2011, when the last troops were withdrawn there. Uh, Everyone wants to see the constitutional order in Afghanistan protected, self-determination in Afghanistan protected. Uh, this is the only way to do it. And I think uh, those who haven't uh, looked at these options will be looking at them now. I'm not going to make any predictions about the future because uh, that's a, that's, I don't have a crystal ball. Yes. But I'm hoping uh, that these ideas gain traction quickly. It's it's certainly a lot easier to talk about these proposals now than it was even two or three years ago. Why do you feel that it's easier to talk about it now than it was a few years ago? Is it just understanding? Is it uh, more media presence talking about this? Is there um, some um, with time after 9-11, after it being 20 years ago, uh, is it less of a sensitive issue? Why is it easier to talk about this? I think there are three things. First, some perspective, uh, seeing now that with lower troop numbers, the conflict still continues. Uh, so it obviously was not about just us. It has been about um, the two countries and about the region much more than the international or U.S. military presence. Secondly, there's a greater understanding that proxy wars need a strong political response. I think Vladimir Putin uh, and the other dictators of today's world have proven that. Uh, and then thirdly, there's impatience. I mean, when fighting in Afghanistan doesn't bring peace over 20 years, it's pretty clear that the solution isn't within Afghanistan's borders. Uh, and some of us came to that conclusion much, much earlier. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost a consensus view now. So, you know, the Taliban used to say, uh, they've got the watches, but time is on our side. Uh, I, I actually think time is on the side of the international community who are determined to see peace come to Afghanistan and who now uh, see more clearly than ever before what the threat to that peace is, and the threat is in neighboring Pakistan. Uh, with the United States announcement, back to that again, uh, do you really think that they're looking uh, to actively make peace over there, or I feel like they're almost kind of pushing away from it? Um, Biden promised that he would take troops out. He's now fulfilled that pro promise. At the same time, uh, 
this administration is very conscious of the um, hell that was unleashed in Iraq and Syria when a vacuum was created in 2011 and ISIS emerged to fill the vacuum. So I saw two statements in Biden's announcement today that were important. One, the U.S. will be keeping a counterterrorism capability in the region because they remain committed to ensuring Afghanistan is never again a platform for al-Qaeda or other groups uh, to use to attack the U.S. or its allies. And secondly, um, he expects regional players to support the peace process. And he said very explicitly, especially Pakistan. Uh, that was a very important signal because it shows that he understands where the main threat to the peace and the main uh, impetus for the continuing war is coming from. So do you think that he's going to be the one uh, bringing, bringing in uh, maybe some a different type of war, a different type of way of dealing with this, uh, other than having troops on the ground? Could that be cyber? Could that be through sanctions? Um, what do you think his plan might be? I think it needs to be a political strategy, mm -hmm. um, starting with sanctions uh, and tough political talk about what Pakistan's role has been up until now and what the costs to Pakistan will be if they continue. You stated in your paper, quote, on the contrary, U.S. policy towards the ISI has been ambiguous since 2001, partially because of the enduring legacy of bilateral cooperation carried over by the Carter and Reagan administrations that persists even today. Uh, so what's the scenario in new American administration? I think that's a, an important point. The U.S., some in the U.S., um, and they're mostly retired officials, retired politicians, remember very vividly the cooperation uh, uh, the United States had with Pakistan and particularly the ISI in mounting support for the Mujahideen to defeat the Soviets in the 1980s. Um, a different generation of people have served in Afghanistan and faced the full force of Pakistan's proxy war, uh, in spite of U.S. Um, wishes that it that it that it end. So some in Washington see Pakistan as an invaluable ally. Um, we saw that when Musharraf came to power, he was he was uh, he was heralded as a great leader, great moderate leader, by many on both sides of the aisle in the U.S. But a new generation has emerged that sees Pakistan as a destabilizing force uh, that has uh, frustrated U.S. strategic objectives in the region now for 20 years. Uh, my bet is that the second group uh, is more influential. Uh, their experience is contemporary. Their um, policy prescriptions track with what is being done to prevent and deter further aggression from Vladimir Putin. Um, but there has been a real debate in the United States because of this legacy from the 1980s. And it's taken longer than it should have um, to uh, articulate what U.S., what the real U.S. national interest is in this day and age. Okay, so you also wrote that this uh, covert proxy war is waged by Pakistan through suicide attacks, planned mass killings of civilians, intimidation, targeted assassinations, as well as information operations uh, aimed at stroking fear in the Afghan population and undermining the credibility of the Afghan government, parliament, media, and other institutions, including its international partners. Uh, yes, uh, okay. But uh, is the world willing to undo these happenings? I, I think the, the world is, um, is impatient with any state that is engaging, is supporting armed conflict in this day and age. The, the number of conflicts around the world actually hasn't grown in recent years as much as some people were expecting. Afghanistan remains one of those enduring conflicts year in, year out, uh, where the death toll remains unimaginably high. Uh, and so 
people will continue to ask, why is that happening? Why are intelligent young Afghan journalists, women journalists in Jalalabad being assassinated? Why are Afghan officials across the country intimidated, injured, uh, and sometimes killed just for serving uh, their own country? Uh, and the answer, of course, will point back to this proxy war. Uh, and But international impatience for that kind of behavior is only growing. I think Afghans and Pakistanis are impatient for it to end. Pakistan is falling behind India in terms of its economic fortunes. Uh, their war in Afghanistan is holding back the entire region. Uh, but the world is also impatient uh, with this kind of spoiler behavior from a country that uh, really doesn't have any reason to be doing this other than inertia, other than the fact that they've always done it and they somehow can't kick the habit. That's not an acceptable argument in this day and age. Uh, and sooner or later, the pressure is going to come uh, to force them to take a, 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 a different course. You know, it's a very small group in Pakistan that championed this policy. Uh, they are a group that came up, uh, were commissioned as officers in the early 70s, just after uh, East Pakistan had been lost. They were traumatized by that experience. They've always seen India in black and white terms uh, as a as a as a as a absolutely. Uh, sworn enemy, and they see their campaign in Afghanistan as a campaign against India. Well, it is not that. It is lots of things, but it is not anything other than uh, a continuing punishment, a continuing litany of 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 of, uh, of crimes committed against the Afghan people. Uh, and you know, war against another country, whether it's a proxy war or another war, is not acceptable in this day and age, uh, and the countries that are that are pursuing these wars, whether it's Russia in Ukraine or Pakistan in Afghanistan, are losing ground economically, and ultimately their own people are the ones who suffer the most, and they're, they will be the driving force for change sooner or later. But by taking a strong position internationally, we can, we can ensure that events move more quickly. Do you feel like uh, your, your average Canadian really cares about this issue? Do they maybe think it's more of a conspiracy? Should they even care about uh, the proxy war going on? There are lots of people who've embraced conspiracies. There's lots of disinformation and propaganda online, obviously. But I think, by and large, Canadians are serious about all the major military commitments our country has made. Uh, we're proud of the fact that South Korea is a free, thriving, economically successful democracy, in part thanks to the sacrifice of Canadians there. We're certainly proud of the sacrifices we made in Europe during two world wars, in the Balkans more recently, uh, in Ukraine today to train the Ukrainian army. Uh, and we're proud of the mission in Afghanistan where we did more than our fair share. Uh, but Canadians are stubborn. And, and principled, and we let, we want to see the job finished. Uh, I don't think we've ever left a major military theater without enduring success, and that's what most Canadians want to see in Afghanistan. If it involves uh, being tough politically now, uh, now that our troops are gone, I think Canadians will be only too happy um, to, to see that happen. Is there any closing regards that you'd like to share with us? Um maybe about your paper or anything in general? Well, I just invite people to inform themselves on this. Um, the paper is a good place to start, but there are a lot of great books that are cited in the paper, as well as other um, assessments, opinions expressed by uh, people who've delved into these issues uh, on the front lines in Pakistan itself. Uh, this is one of the opportunities we all have as citizens to make a difference by focusing on the the real root of the issue. Uh, there have been a lot of attempts to deflect from this issue, to ignore this issue, to um, focus on corruption in the Afghan government or uh, civilian casualties in Afghanistan. All of these are important issues, but none of them will start to um, 
be addressed until there's a ceasefire, until there's an enduring peace in Afghanistan. But to do that, we have to change. We have to stop Pakistan's proxy war. Uh, and I think this should be required reading for anyone who's interested uh, in the region, anyone who's interested in the legacy of 20 years of heavy international engagement in Afghanistan. Uh, the paper's had a, a great reception so far from Afghans, from many Pakistanis as well, where it's been cited in the press. Uh, let's rally ar around uh, these proposals and let's make peace a reality for Afghans who deserve it. Uh, they've sacrificed continuously for really two generations in a, in a never-ending war. President Biden talked about a for ending a forever war in Afghanistan. Well, it's not the U.S. that caused the forever war. It's not 9-11 that caused the forever war. The never-ending conflict has been fueled by a proxy war agenda that's really a neo-colonialist agenda uh, championed by a few generals in Rawalpindi and in Pakistan's inter-services intelligence. Let's uh, ensure they don't hold the region and the world hostage for much longer. Uh, one more question before you go. Um, I know that you're mentioning some different presidents, and this war has been going on for a very uh, long time. Um, what is your perspective on how each president, uh, American president has dealt with this and Canadian president? Well, the paper notes that there have been at least four major opportunities to end the war. First, um, in 2003, just as ISI was setting out to relaunch its proxy war, um, a message could have been sent a stern message from Washington that probably would have prevented that. Um, then later in 2005-06, when the proxy war started to be fought on scale again, and the Taliban had the goal of retaking southern Afghanistan, uh, there was at the end of the Bush administration a surge, and then under Obama an even larger surge. Uh, but there was never a political reckoning with Pakistan to ensure the root of the conflict uh, was was removed. Uh, then there was the um, surge itself in 2008-2009, uh, which should have been accompanied by a regional strategy to change Pakistan's behavior. That didn't happen. And then finally, there was the uh, the operation to... Uh, take out Osama bin Laden in Abbottabad, uh, it's unbelievable that that wasn't followed up with a very different approach towards Pakistan. Uh, but it's never too late to do the right thing. Uh, and uh, I don't think any president so far gets very high marks for their regional strategy. Uh, but the United States has the capacity to get things right even as its military exits Afghanistan, as far as I'm concerned. Do you think way back when, if instead of being the ambassador to Afghanistan, if you were the ambassador to uh, Pakistan, do you think your perspective would have been different on a lot of these issues? Very much so. And I think that's one of the reasons why there hasn't been action on this front, because when capitals ask their people in Pakistan, is Pakistan supporting the Taliban? They say, well, no, we haven't seen any evidence of that. Uh, they have been blind to the reality uh, around them, and in fact, unable to to see it because it's camouflaged so well. And this support comes out of places in the tribal areas and Balochistan, where foreigners, journalists, officials, or otherwise uh, are never able to go. Um, I'm not sure my perspective would have been different, but I know the perspective of many people uh, has been different. Uh, and. Uh, They've been counseling, they've been advising their capitals to go easy on Pakistan. They've been highlighting progress that they think Pakistan is, is, is making. Meanwhile, Afghanistan has continued to burn. Uh, at some point, there needs to be a larger reckoning, uh, and that's going to have to involve an end to this proxy war. That end will only happen if sanctions, FATF blacklist, and other political measures are enacted. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. I really appreciate having you here. And to our audience, thank you for watching today's News Talk with Julia Cosby at the International News Channel.